Hey, badass black girls, and they making big moves. Hey, badass black girls, nothing that you can't do. They are the future, I'm trying to tell you. They want the best, no time to settle. They got the strength to handle the pressure. These are the queens, nobody better. Yeah, yeah, changing the narrative, that is imperative. They about to rock this. Tell the women that you got this. Got no time for people who are toxic. It's all love, good vibes. Uh, you know I got your back, girl. Talking issues that matter. This is badass black girl, yeah. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining Badass Black Girl for another episode. We have another wonderful lady with us today. Her name is Lady Brian. Hi, Lady Brian. Hi, how are you? So excited, so excited that you're here, that you're going to talk to us about what you do, about who you are. Why don't you start by introducing yourself to our viewers? Yeah, so again, my name is Lady Brian. Uh, I am a professional spoken word artist born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I am also the cultural curator of an organization called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, which is a grassroots think tank that um, advocates for public policy interests of Black folks in Baltimore City. And then lastly, I am a new executive director of the Black Arts District, which is a arts and entertainment district in West Baltimore. Such a pleasure to have you, to talk to you about what you do. And wow, <laughs> so, so many facets to, to your work, to your life. Let's start with the spoken word aspect. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit how you came to be a spoken word artist. Yeah, so I have been performing um, spoken word for about 17 years now. Um, I started really early. I was in grade school and middle school. And um, I used to watch a show called Deaf Poetry Jam, <laughs> which no longer uh, airs. But it was really inspiring to me to see poets like Sonny Patterson and, you know, Sheehan and a number of other poets um, just gracing those stages. And I was just inspired to write my first spoken word piece. Um, and, and from that time, I just had so many people that supported me and gave me stages and spaces to perform more often. And I really um, just just had a knack for it and, and a real love for it and have been expanding ever since. Um, and so that's where I got my start. But I'd say, you know, I was a debater in high school. And so I kind of fused poetry and debate. And then in college, um, I did a lot of poetry performances. So that's where I really got my footing. And like I said, just, I kept going from there. Let's talk a little bit about what it takes to become a spoken word poet. So a for sure passion, you talked about having a knack for it and uh, mixing two things that you liked a lot, poetry and debate. What other skills do you think that someone interested in becoming a spoken word poet would need? Yeah, well, I mean, it starts with really the, the basics of poetry or writing in general, right? So I think studying the craft and really learning the technical aspects of writing is where you start. But when you talk about spoken word poetry, it is more like a combination of sort of page poetry, but also stage poetry. And stage poetry is a lot like theater, right? It's, it's an embodied experience, right? Performing with your whole self. And so that takes a little more time kind of honing that craft, finding your voice, finding performative elements that will enhance the poem that you are trying to convey or the message that you're trying to convey. Um, and so finding open mics and finding spaces that'll let you explore what it's like to be on stage, I think is really necessary to become um, a polished spoken word poet because um, you can't really get those skills sort of behind the scenes. Like you gotta be on stage and you gotta kind of break that that barrier and, and find your comfortable space um, on a stage. In addition to being a poet, you do a lot of work that can, that is activism, ah. right? Activism <laughs> um, that is particularly needed nowadays, oh, which has always been needed, but now more than ever, I feel for our generation. Um, how do you see the relationship between the two, between your sure. spoken word poetry and the work that you do in the jails, for instance, or working with the beautiful organizations that try to um, promote the well-being of Black folks? 
Sure. Yeah, for me, I, I oftentimes categorize myself as an artivist, um, which is like this intersection of art and activism, right? Um, because when you look at particularly social movements that have been outgrowths of the Black community, you find artists at the forefront of those movements, right? They become the pulse of those movements. They are creating the songs, the mantras, the messaging, the images that keep us going, right? And I, I feel um, that that is, is true. Art is definitely a driver of particular agendas and can be a force um, to, to help us get connected to movements that are advocating for our material conditions being better. And so um, I am typically writing poems that are connected to social justice issues. I'm performing them in spaces where I can connect to people so that um, they can be more informed, be more aware, be more activated, right, um, as it relates to different issues. And I am often trying to teach young people that they have agency and can get involved in their community as well for whatever issues make sense to them. So I would say that's the way that I, for myself, am connecting activism with poetry. Tell us a little bit more about what you do um, in terms of activism what what are some of the activities that you that you lead some of um the events that you take part of tell us a little bit more yeah so um i would say um a few things so for example um, in my time working with Do More Baltimore and beyond, um, I was doing poetry workshops and residencies in um, prisons and group homes with um, young people who were um, being tried as adults in some detention centers um, where there's more transient youth population. And like I said, as well in group homes. And I think this is a space where um, young people are not getting the kind of extracurricular activities, art-based activities um, to express themselves. And these are young people who need it more than ever, right? So I think this is a connected, this is an activity or a space in which I think that activism shows up. Um, during 2015 and 2016, when um, there were a number of uh, protests and riots happening as it related to the Freddie Gray movement, uh, or the Freddie Gray incident rather, um, I was performing at a lot of rallies. I was performing in Annapolis as we, as we were pushing legislation around the law enforcement officer's bill of rights. Um, and then, you know, that kind of resurfaced actually in 2020, right, around the uh, George Floyd and a number of other um, incidents that happened, Breonna Taylor, um, as an example. And so I find myself at protest um, or speaking, you know, in 2020 online <laughs> in, a, in a virtual space about these same issues. Issues, right. And again, attaching my poetry and my artistry to these agendas, these social movements. Um, I would also say that there is a level of mentorship that happens through Do More Baltimore that I think is its own form, like I said, of activism in that I'm instilling in, in young people that they have agency through their art form and that, that it can be used to help to mobilize and activate people um, and spaces that are important to them. Um, yeah, those are some examples. So speaking of the young people that you work with, so a lot of young people these days feel that something has to be done and they want to be active. They want to do something to, to change the world. Mm -hmm. What are some steps that, um, uh, let's say a teenager, um, a young adult could take to become um, an activist? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you need to study, right? So oftentimes we think that we are re like we are inventing something new or we're coming up with this new concept, this new idea or making this thing that's never happened before come to fruition. And oftentimes that is not true. Um, it is important that we study of our ancestors, the work of freedom fighters who came before us, the folks who have been laying the groundwork for, for how we exist today, right? Studying what they did, what worked and what did not work, and then using that as a way to ground yourself and figure out what you can do to carry that torch forward. So studying and reading and understanding um, the, the kind of history we come from that we don't wanna repeat or the things we do wanna repeat, right? Figuring that out. I think the second thing is attaching oneself, like young people should be working to attach themselves 
to a movement or to elders who are currently working to do whatever it is they're interested in, right? So if you're interested in environmental justice, find an environmental justice-based organization that you can attach yourself to, work with, volunteer with, right? If you're talking about Black Lives Matter, find an organization that is working to the benefit of, of Black folks, especially as it relates to encounters with the police, learn from them, attach yourself to their work. You know what I mean? Like, I think oftentimes, again, we want to work in silos and we want to separate ourselves from things that are already moving to create something new when your energy would be most beneficial by attaching yourself to something that is already working and, and, and giving your gifts and talents to that. So those are two main things that I would suggest to young people who want to get involved. Study, learn, develop your own consciousness, and then find some people who are like-minded and join the movement and bring those talents and skills to the work that's being done. I, I can help listening to you. I can help thinking that um, the place where you grew up must have played such an important role in making you the person you are today. Um, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how your environment um, helped you determine what you wanted to focus on? Sure. Uh, so again, I'm from Baltimore. I'm from East Baltimore. And, um, you know, I grew up in a working class family, working class neighborhood. Um, I my, my father was a Marine. Uh, my mother ran a daycare and she was also an artist in her own right. Um, and I grew up in a family of preachers. So I, I grew up around a bunch of speakers and leaders. Um, and I think that kind of instilled um, that side of me, right? I was never afraid or shy to be on the stage. Again, my mother, she has a, a very artsy side. So I think that definitely um, helped me to grow into the artist that I am. In fact, sh she's named after Nikki Giovanni. My mother's first name is Nikki. Um, so she's named after a poet. So I guess it was destined. Um, and I think my radical side, my more revolutionary side definitely comes from my father again, who was a Marine. And we had, you know, long conversations about history and, and uh, race relations and white supremacy and like global politics, right? Like, I think that that definitely kind of instilled the, the fire inside of me that, that leads to, you know, my radical side. Um, I think beyond that, you know, Baltimore is a, can be a rough city. And you see a lot of things happening in Baltimore, a lot of injustice from the top on down. And um, it's easy as a young person to, really want to make a change and see things be different, right? Um, and so for me, I had a supportive family that allowed me to be involved in all the kind of things that I wanted to be involved with. And they knew they had a fire starter of a daughter and I don't think they ever worked to like um, douse that fire. In fact, I think they fanned the flame and um, it really, I think supported just my belief that I had the ability to make change or to be a leader or to be a speaker in my own right. And yeah, I would say that's, that's kind of what made me who I am. And what keeps you going? Because you're, I mean, you're doing so much and you're full of energy. And even when you, you speak, and I'm not talking about you doing your spoken word poetry, just having a conversation. We can feel the passion. We can feel uh, the commitment. What keeps you going? What are some of the things that um, make you know that you, what you're doing is what you're supposed to be doing, that that's what's meant to be? Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, honestly, I, I want to say it's community, right? Like the Black community is definitely consistently affirming and confirming what I'm doing is what I should be doing, right? And so the community that I have built both in the artistic community, but just, you know, Baltimore's Black community, um, you know, and beyond, I think it is, it, it is knowing that they deserve better, um, knowing that there are so many other people who are also working to the benefit of our community um, and wanting to, to make them and my ancestors and my family proud is, is just what keeps me going. Because again, I think that our people deserve so much more than what we get. And there are so many people who poured into me that I feel like it's my duty to make sure that I then pour into the next generation who um, deserves much, just as much as I received and more. So I, I, I don't know if there's anything more than that, just, just believing um, that, that we deserve excellence and knowing that I should be bringing my most excellent self to the table. How is it to be Black in Baltimore? 
I mean, Baltimore is a is a predominantly black city. It's one of the few left, right? And so you you look at so many cities that have been gentrified, that have lost their flavor, lost their color, right? Um, but Baltimore is one of those cities that's still holding on as a predominantly black city, and it and there is such a resilience in this city, right? Like it's it's been black for a really long time. Like you're talking about even during slavery time, uh, Baltimore was a city that had a really large black free population, right? So the, <laughs> I feel like the spirit that is in Baltimore comes from that. Like is is you know black people who've been free and been ram been rambunctious and 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 thriving here for a really long time. Um, and you still feel that that fire, that that energy, um, that that brilliance in the city. Um, but it's also again a place where though you have Black leadership and you have so many Black people, um, you can still see the effects of white supremacy in this city and still feel um, the ways in which that that oppressive system um, is negatively impacting our city. And so though it feels great, it feels like I don't have to, um, uh, I, I don't have to mask parts of myself. I feel like I can be my full self in this city and speak as a fully Black cis het woman in this city and I don't have to cover any parts of myself um I I still recognize that there's a lot of work to be done in this city and and though it's a great black city to be in um it's a lot of work to realize the things and actualize the things that black folks in the city deserve and when do you when do you take a break from all your activities and how <laughs> do you uh, practice self-care and just making sure that you're okay so that you can continue to do the yeah. work that you do? It's such a good question. And I feel like it's something that comes up so often. And um, I, I see why. The more stuff I take on, the harder it is for me to answer this question because I recognize, um, you know, being vulnerable that I don't take enough time for self-care or, um, you know, to, to instill better self-care practices um, because I have been sort of evolving into a workaholic without ever noticing it. Um, and so I think, you know, what I try to do is I try to have a balance in my social life and my work life and try to make real boundaries, right? Intentionally plan breaks far enough out that I won't cancel them for meetings and events and, you know, what have you. But, you know, I also try to nurture my artist self and also being an executive director and also being an organizer. Like those are like three jobs. And then that makes my social life almost feel like a job too. So it can be difficult. But what I will say is, again, I prioritize family. I prioritize friends. I'm intentional about saying yes, even when I feel like just going to sleep. I'm like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the birthday party. I'm going to go to the, you know, the things that, that pour back into me. And I also have, um, I do things like I love getting my nails done. I don't know if you can see them, but like, it makes me happy. Getting my nails done is like a small thing that makes me happy. So I try to find little things like that, um, that, you know, other people might look at as frivolous, but those are my things. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, well, <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming here today and talking to us. You bring so much hope because, I mean, so many people want to follow in your footsteps and because of the advice you gave today, um, it feels possible. Well, it's it's a lot of work, but at least it, it feels possible. And um, thank you for everything you do. Um, what is something that you would want us to take with us um, to ponder something, um, a word of advice or some additional wisdom oh that's a that's a good question well i i don't know i'll say something that i'm pondering and perhaps you all can ponder with me um so i mentioned earlier that i am the executive director of the black arts district right and um Arts and entertainment districts are typically used as a way to revitalize disenfranchised or disinvested communities, right? And so as this new executive director, I have been really thinking through how can arts and entertainment 
be a vehicle to revitalize communities without gentrifying communities, right? Like how can we help to shape new possibilities, which, you know, is, is, is the epitome of art, right? If you are an artist, you are a creator. So creation comes out of art in inevitably. So it is a beautiful part of art, but how do we make sure those creations and those changes and that revitalization doesn't erase the very nuts and bolts of what that community used to be? And so it's something that is very difficult that I'm wrestling with. And I don't know if that's what you meant of what we should, I should be leaving you all to ponder, but it is certainly what I am pondering. And, you know, I'm, I'm open to, to hearing any thoughts uh, about how we can make that possible. Thank you. That's such an important question. And I hope we'll get some feedback and maybe we can get together again in, um, in the future and talk about some of the ideas that our viewers shared with us. Certainly. Well, good luck with um, your new position and everything else that you do. And we'll be in touch again soon to talk a little bit more about all the wonderful things that you, that you do and the leadership role that you, you've you assumed. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I wish you a very well rest of your 2020. <laughs> you too. And see you in 2021. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.